I would love to introduce our speaker for today, Diana Kelly. Diana is a security, her security career spans over 30 years. She is the co-founder and CTO of Security Curve and donates much of her time to volunteer work in the cybersecurity community, including serving on the ACM Ethics and Plagiarism Committee as CTO and board member at Sightline Security. As a board member and inclusion working group champion at I'm not, not going to say this right. W I C Y S. Um, I don't want to even enunciate that. Wesis. Um, Wesis. Yeah. Wesis. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Cybersecurity yeah. uh, Committee Advisor at Comp TIA Advisory Counselor, um, Bartlett College of Science and Mathematics, Bridgewater State University, and R S A C U S Program Committee. Um, Diana also produces the hashtag My Secure Cyber Y series and is the host of Bright Talks, the Security Balance Act. Diana is also the principal consulting analyst at Tech Vision Research and a member of the Analyst Syndicate. She was a cybersecurity field CTO for Microsoft, global executive security advisor at IBM Security, and GM at Symatic, Symtech, sorry. Uh, VP. Yep, semantics, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, VP at Burton Group and now Gartner and a manager at KPMG. She sought after um, to speak and we are so excited to have her speak today. And we have to get you started, um, to get her started. I have a little video clip to show you from her. Just give me one second to... about cybersecurity lately, largely because of what happened to Sony, companies and Yeah, so um, if anybody was thinking I would never do that, 
Uh, you might be surprised because we're human beings and we do certain things <laughs> that are just by, by nature, really. Um, we, we're actually very helpful uh, for each other and with each other. And so a lot Diana, your sound went off. We can see your screen, no problem. We just can't hear you right now. Try talking now. I think we should be able to hear you now. Okay, is it okay now? Yep, you're all good. Oh, good, okay. So sorry about that. Um, but if, if anybody, as you were watching that, you thought, oh, that would never be me, I would never, I would never give out my password that way. If you noticed what the interviewer was doing, she was actually using some tricks to get people to forget that they were giving out information. So by first asking that, that one woman about, you know, what's her password? And she said, oh, it's, it's my dog's name. She didn't immediately say, what's your dog's name? She said, oh, that's so cute. What kind of dog? Right, so now that woman was sort of distracted. She, now she's in that zone of, I wanna talk about my dog. Most of us who have dogs are very excited to talk about our dogs. So she said, yeah, you know, it's a Papillon mix. And then she said, oh, what's its name? And by this point, now they're having a conversation and an interaction, and she said the name of her dog. So this is, we're all human beings, and we all do certain things that are just very human. And that's really what attackers take advantage of. They take advantage of the fact that we respond and we try and help each other and share information with each other. And there's a, a professor, Robert Cialdini, down in Arizona who has written a whole book on persuasion and influence. And there are six principles. And what I'm going to do is going to walk through some of the research that supports those six principles so you can understand what's going on underneath persuasion. In other words, how attackers are getting us to click. And once we know how they get us to click, then we can be better about doing training. If you've ever had to go through that security training where uh, you know it's, it's like some 20 minute video once a year and it's a requirement by your company that you, you watch it and you sit there and you go through and it's like, ugh, you know, and you just click through, take the test at the end and just get it over with. That's not really effective training. We want training that's gonna turn around these principles of persuasion and influence and take the power back from the attackers and bring them back to us as the, the defenders and protectors. So we're all human. As a reminder, when we saw that video, we are in fact all human. We make human decisions and we do human things. And again, the attackers are trying to take advantage of this. So one of the main things that we do as human beings is something called a, a click were, or it's a fixed action pattern. And this has been seen in the natural world again and again in a variety of different experiments. But one of, that's one of the most famous was by um, a researcher named Lorenz, and it was around the gray lag goose egg retrieval. And in, what they posited was that the, the, the goose wasn't just bringing her own egg back in. She was responding to something that looked egg-like. So they started to, um, when her, when she, when a, a gray leg goose is sitting on the nest, if, a, if an egg rolls out, she always goes, she pulls back in, right? She's got to sit on this egg until it, until it, it, it begins to hatch. And there's some, and that gets hardwired. So what Lorenz did was said, what if we did things that weren't eggs? What if they were just kind of ovoid and they weren't actually this goose's egg? And the goose was responding to, yep, yeah, bringing those eggs in as well. And that's this little click word. It's a bit of a shortcut. So she isn't just looking at, is this egg? I'm going to identify it, smell it. She's just like, this thing rolled out. It looks egg-like. I'm just going to grab it and I'm going to put it back into the nest. And it actually helps animals to respond very quickly. Uh, it helps us as human beings, we create our own mental shortcuts too, which helps us to respond more quickly. So if you've ever been in a car and you kind of went on autopilot, that's you using those shortcuts, those mental shortcuts to just get from one place to another without having to think too much. And although it may not feel like, oh gee, thinking is really hard, it actually is. It uses up a huge amount of energy in our brains. If you've been sitting, a lot of us have been feeling this a lot more in the pandemic. We sit at our desks all day and we're on 
video calls and writing emails and we get up at the end of the day and all oh, we've been sitting there but we're exhausted we're completely wrung out that's because of our brains working taking a lot of energy from us so very naturally we create these mental shortcuts and sometimes they get so embedded in us they're like part of our dna if you saw something really scary running at you you wouldn't think you just run that's a mental shortcut that's a click work and that keeps us really effective it helps us to protect our energy it helps us to make decisions in times of stress but it also means that it can be exploited and that's exactly what phishing and and cyber criminal fishers and cyber criminals do they exploit those shortcuts to achieve something called quote compliance which um, if you're an auditor it's not that kind of compliance it's actually a psychological term that just has to do with someone who wants to persuade you to do something that you don't really want to do they're able to persuade you to get that compliance and that's what the attackers are using so how are they getting to guess it i think a wonderful framework to use to understand how they get to ask guess is robert cialdini's uh, six principles and those principles are reciprocity scarcity authority consistency liking and consensus. And I'm going to talk through a, a few of these and provide some really interesting research that supports. So this isn't just someone sitting in a, in a room thinking, hey, I, 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 I have observed a couple of people. And so qualitatively, I think that these are, are principles that human beings respond to. There's a ton of science that backs up these six principles. And the first one and the most important one is that we human beings, for all it can feel like sometimes there are people that are being jerks or idiots or cutting into your lane on the highway, we're actually a we're pretty fair <laughs> um, entities with each other. And so we, we do have reciprocity. If somebody does something nice for us, our instinct is to do something nice back. One, one really interesting piece of research was with mint, with chocolates. So by uh, supplying people at the end of a meal, a mint or a chocolate, it was found that tipping increased by 18 to 21%. So that's a pretty massive increase for what what's you know just a couple of cents of, of chocolate or mints right it was very very low impact to the restaurant to the server you know these mints that are very low cost put them onto the onto the um the tray that's got the bill hand that over and your tip is going to go up by a very significant amount there was another oh and i have at the bottom of this i have all of the research if you, anybody is, is loves to go and, and read um research articles i have the research all the research i'm quoting you can see them at the bottom of the slides and the slides um, are available can be available afterwards too um so the other interesting piece of research around this was uh, with a a group that were going to uh, for they were brought together for a particular experiment but one, one part of the experiment, we're gonna actually show a little bit of the experiment later, a little talk more about the other side of it. But one part of it was around whether or not they would buy a raffle ticket. And this assistant who was named Joe would give some people a free soda and say, hey, I was just at the soda machine and there was an extra one, here you go. Those people that had something nice done for them that Joe gave a free soda to, they were much more likely to purchase the raffle ticket when the raffle ticket part of the experiment came up than others. So what does this tell us? It tells us again that we we respond pretty fairly. And if somebody does something nice for us as human beings, we're very likely to do something back. And then the last experiment in, in this space was around holiday cards. And I, I sort of love this one because I feel like I would exactly be, I would be one of these 20% is that these researchers just sent holiday cards to 578 people at random. They, it was a while ago when this experiment was done. So they took their names out of a phone book. Um, if you remember what phone books were like, they just looked up in the phone book and, and, and got the addresses. And 20% of the people that got the holiday cards just thought, hmm, I must have forgotten who this person is. But uh, that was so nice of them. They sent me a card. So they plopped a card back out and mailed it back out um, in response. The next principle is scarcity. We often want what we can't have. And if you've ever watched one of those shopping channels where they say, we only have you know, X number of these left, you know, hurry now, supplies are limited. What they're doing is they're playing on our innate sense of, of, of valuing things that are scarce. And that comes in two different ways. One is if there's not a lot of something, 
we think I better get it before it runs out. But the other way to create scarcity is on a time base. And when we go and look at a couple of fish, you'll see that time base is used a lot by attackers because we 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 have just the scarcity of time. If you don't respond now, if you don't respond in 15 minutes, then something could disappear. Uh, one example of what attackers are doing a lot of was right around the first stimulus checks. They were doing a lot of the fish that you saw going out to people at the time were related to you will lose your check if you don't respond in X amount of time. You have a couple of hours and scarcity gets us our adrenaline running because we start thinking I'm going to miss out. I have to act. So it really pushes us to be to take action because this value and this possibility is so is, we don't want to lose it. And the research here uh, that was interesting was around cookies. And in this, this experiment, 200 students were asked to rate if they wanted a particular kind of cookie or not. You know, and they had like oatmeal raisin and they had chocolate chip. But what the researchers found was that it didn't matter what kind of cookie it was. What mattered was how much cookie was there. So the fewer, the, the rarer the cookie, the more desirable it was rated by the students. And then interestingly, the very most desirable was one that had been abundant early, but then became scarce. And that it was that watching it go away that really drove people to feel, oh, that has more value. So this scarcity is very, very strong in us to respond to. We also respond to authority. And you'll see that the, the phishing, the cyber criminals take advantage of, of this response quite a bit. Um, so in authority, you know, you think about like on TV, you have like that. I'm not a doctor, but I, I always think it's hilarious that back in the day, doctors used to recommend which kind of cigarette was healthier for you. Um, yeah, <laughs> very different time. One of the most interesting, but also uh, very, very controversial experiments in this space was the Milgram obedience ex experiment. And it had ethical repercussions because in the, in the experiment, the person who was coming in, who was the actual test subject, was told that it was about um, pain and about the ability for people to withstand pain and, and that they were in a different kind of experiment than they really were. So they thought that they were administering shocks to a test subject. The test subject was not being shocked. They would get a little light that showed up when they were being shocked, shocked, right? Because in quotes, they were not actually being shocked. And they would respond as though they were in pain, but they were not actually shocked. However, the subject did believe that they were giving the shock to this test subject. And what they were really trying to do was to understand how authority plays into people's ability or likelihood to do something they wouldn't normally do otherwise. And the, what was discovered in the experiment was that 65% of the subjects would deliver the maximum voltage the maximum shock. Again, it wasn't a real shock, but they didn't know that. When the authority figure told them, this is important, you need to do this, please keep going. So they were coached by the experimenter to give that shock. If it was just them on their own, they were stopping at a much, much lower voltage level. In fact, extremely low. But when the authority figure said, this is important, this is part of the experiment, you must do it, they would actually go up to the maximum as directed, a 65% of them. So it's very powerful. When we have authority figures telling us to do something, it, it, requiring us to do something, we are much more likely to listen to them than if it's just somebody who we don't trust or we don't know. So that becomes very powerful. That authority figure can become very powerful. We're also pretty consistent as, as, a, as a species, which is nice. Um, so there are a bunch of different things that go on with consistency here. Um, Political yard signs are an example. I, I used to think, you maybe you guys you thought this too, but I used to think that the reason put, people put up a political yard sign was that, you know, they, that they're trying to tell everybody in the neighborhood, this is who I'm voting for and I'm proud of it. But And that's a part of it, but it's actually the consistency aspect of it. If you talk to a candidate and they say, well, you put up a sign in, in your yard for me and you put up that sign, the likelihood that you're going to vote for anybody else drops to almost zero. At that point, you're voting for them. 
So the sign is there both to advertise to other people about this candidate, but also very much to ensure that because you've taken that action to put the sign up, you're now an almost guaranteed vote. You're also more likely to go and vote too. Uh, fitness tracker apps, anybody who's got a Fitbit, you gotta get those 5,000 steps in, or you know, you use AppDiv and you wanna get to Ruby at the next level for your outdoor running. Um, these are all different things that, that take advantage of our natural response to, we like consistency and we, we will actually stay the course once we're on a course, once we started to build something in. And the research around here was around hotel towels. So if you've all, probably all seen these signs, if you well back when we were going to hotels more, that says, you know, please help the environment and, and, you know, hang that towel back up if you're willing to reuse it. Well, in this experiment, they took that one, one step further. And at check-in, they asked people to commit to, to create consistency for the behavior of uh, environmentally friendly activities like putting the, the towel up. And then they gave them a lapel pin. And they said, and please wear this now proudly that you're, you're help. thank you so much for helping the environment wear this. And they tested against people who had the lapel pin and were asked to behave uh, in an environmentally friendly way versus people who weren't and just got the little signs in their, their room. And the guests that had committed at check-in were 25% more likely to, um, to hang up their towels. But overall, there was a 40% increase in, in this behavior. So by working into consistency, working with people's need or, or desire to be consistent, we can also increase that compliance of people doing something. And liking, right? We, we've all seen liking and how much liking becomes psychologically powerful, whether it's, you know, you see your friends liking something on social media or, uh, and then you start liking it. Or if you've posted something and you start going and looking, are people liking this? Am I getting a lot of attention or people, you know, people, we kind of like to be in sync with each other and we like to be in sync with people <clears throat> that we like. So when people engage us, and we like them as human beings, we're much more likely to do what they want. I mean, think about it. <clears throat> if you have a close friend that asks you to do something, you're much more likely to do it than if a stranger comes up on the street. But if the stranger comes up on the street and is very engaging and likable with you, you're also probably a lot more likely to do what they ask. So being a likable person or a likable entity actually helps people to do what you, it creates a power of persuasion for you. And uh, Reagan's and the raffle experiment that I had talked about a little bit earlier with Joe bringing the soda, um, that that's, they, they actually did another aspect in that, in that, and they were trying to see if Joe was friendlier and was more liked, how much more likely they were to buy the raffle ticket. And the more that people liked Joe and felt he was a, a good guy, the more likely they were to do what he asked when he came along with that raffle ticket and tried to sell it to them. So um, just think about that in your life or you're more likely to do something for someone you like or somebody you hate, probably somebody you like. We also have consensus, which is a, a similar adjacency to this, which is where we start looking at the, the wisdom of the crowd. And if everybody's doing something, and probably you heard this growing up, you know, if everybody jumps off the Brooklyn Bridge, are you going to go with it? You know, you're going to be a lemming and, and follow. And that's because this is something that's very innate in us as human beings to when we see a lot of other people doing something, we start thinking, maybe that's right. Maybe that's the right thing to do. We're a very collaborative species. We help, we survive and thrive by helping each other. So when we see other people doing things, then we often think I, I should do that and I should be a, a part of that. So this becomes really the wisdom of the crowd. And the experiment here was around light dots. And they brought people individually into a room and shown a, a dot of light up in a corner. Now there's something called autokinetics that happens when we look at a, a, be, a little beam of light. It wasn't super bright, so it, nobody's eyes were getting hurt. But when you look at a, at a beam of light in, in a corner, it may be stationary, but our, our, the autokinetic phenomenon means that we start to think, is it moving a little bit? Maybe it's moving, I don't know. So it's very hard actually for us to, in, in an experiment like that, know if it's stationary or moving because it appears to be moving. 
So this was a really good point for them to test on the power of consensus because it was it was hard. It's not as easy as if I if you know if I ask people if you're not colorblind, what's the color of my shirt? Everybody's going to have a high confidence rate on the color of my shirt. But with this dot, because of autokinetics, it, people were thinking: Is it moving? Is it not moving? Is it stationary? It was in fact stationary. But um, so independently, people made it an, a call. They said, "I think it's moving. I think it's it's not moving. I think it's moving a lot." Um, and then that was that was their own that was their decision, their individual decision. The experimenters wrote that down. Then they brought the groups. They brought the people together in a group, and they discussed, is it moving or not? And again, because of this phenomena of autokinetics, it was pretty easy for them to get convinced that what they had thought it was moving or it wasn't moving to get convinced otherwise. And over over the time of the hour of these, this, these people now talking about what they thought they saw, they normalized into a group consensus, which is wonderful when we're trying to get um, decisions made in, in corporate America, right? If we When we move towards consensus, that means we can all engage and take that forward. So this is a powerful, uh, all, all influence is powerful for good, but it also can be powerful if the attackers misuse it. So this normalization occurred. And interestingly, even when that group was separated again and they were back as individuals, they retained that normalized decision of whether that dot was moving or not. So they, as by, by being in that crowd, discussing this with the crowd, they changed permanently uh, their thinking about whether that dot had been moving. So let's see how attackers are using this and what they're doing in phishing. So let's go fishing, thinking about that. Uh, this is a real example of a fish. It's from phishing.org. If you want to go um, take a look at, at um, other examples, there are some good ones up at phishing.org. Symantec also keeps up a good um, list of them. I have some examples there too from Symantec that are coming up. But Fishing, you may be thinking, well, you know, is fishing like the coolest, most cutting edge uh, problem in, in cybersecurity? Actually, phishing is still the number one infiltration vector for all kinds of attacks. Um, for uh, attacks that are monetarily motivated when you're trying to get people to transfer money to you, ransomware attacks most often at a very high rate are introduced through a phishing attack. A ransomware attack requires that there has to be a way to land that malicious software, that ransomware software in a system. Most often the way that they're getting into systems, into your network, onto your computer is through phishing. And not just getting a good phishing email, but a phishing email that then gets us to click. Because when we click, they can get us to go to a site that may have um, malware on it. They can get us to give up our identity information and passwords, Then, and they can also get us to click on executables, which then download and, and are uh, executed on our systems, which could then be ransomware that locks us up. So phishing is, and getting people to recognize phish is one of the most important things that we can do to stop cyber crime. And that's why they take advantage of all of these, these persuasion activities, right? They want their compliance. So here's this one, right? PayPal. PayPal is, what are they using there? This is authority. If you have a PayPal account, PayPal has a level of authority for you because they are the entity that transacts for you. So this one comes from PayPal. And you will see this again and again in, in well-crafted fish because fish these days are way past the I'm a Nigerian prince in jail, and if you send me a million dollars, I'll send you $10 million. Those, those almost never, uh, they still float around a little bit, but those scams are very rare. Most of the, the scams that you see nowadays are very well constructed, and they use these principles. So here we go. We've got PayPal. And then down, if you go to the next one, um, uh, it says that you, know, uh, you can't see what you can and can't do with your account. Log in. At, at the resolution center. So they're saying, go, we want to help you resolve this. So there's a little reciprocity. And but there's also some time because you know, if I can't, if I don't get this resolved, I'm not going to be able to use my account. And then they say log in. Now you think if you click on that login, is that going to go to PayPal so you can resolve a problem with your account? Or is it going to go to some attacker who's trying to get your PayPal? your credentials, it's going to go to the attacker. Um, so yeah, again, and how would you know necessarily looking at that? That doesn't look um, 
a lot like it's not coming from PayPal, right? They even have, if you look at the top, it says service at internationalpaypal.com, right? Because they're trying to they're trying to fake you out on who it came from. But within the within the brackets, you can see that it actually came from a service at PayPal at Outlook.com. So it was a free account that someone had set up. But if you didn't weren't looking at that part of the email, then it this could be pretty easy to get tricked by, and it's because they're using some of these, these compliance and influence persuasion. Uh, some more examples, again, Instagram, IRS, right, authorities. These are places that, uh, that, that we trust. So they're using, they're leveraging that trust, they're leveraging that authority. Sign in, that's what they're doing. They're getting you to click. And this one is kind of nice. They've also given you a code too. So they're saying, hey, someone else is trying to sign in as you, but it's not really you. And here's a special code, which a lot of us think, well, if we got this one time code, it's gotta be right. But no, it's them. Nobody was trying to sign in. What they're trying to do is get you to sign into their, their space and get your Instagram credentials. You might be saying to yourself, well, Instagram credentials aren't that bad. Right. Well, somebody gets into my Instagram account. What are they going to do? Post pictures, um, you know, or like things that I don't necessarily like. That is, that's a possibility. They could post things on Instagram, and a lot of businesses are using Instagram now. So your Instagram account could be part of your business. But the other thing that they're really, really trying to do is they're trying to do this credential stuffing attacks. And credential stuffing is that you take advantage of the fact that we reuse passwords a lot. So Jimmy Kimmel was right. Actually, one two three four is a very common password. And it, many people use it for multiple different accounts. So attackers will often try and get a password at sort of a, an easier to attack account. And then they start going to more high value accounts with it. Because you may use a password for Instagram or for one shopping site that you don't go to very often and you don't store your, your, your uh, credit card information. But... You may also use that same password for, say, your Amazon account, which does have your credit card information, or maybe your healthcare account or your banking account, and that's credential stuffing. They get the they they hack for um, username passwords, and then they try and stuff those credentials into other more high value sites. Uh, IRS here, this one, claim your tax refund online. So we've got authority, we've got a little bit of scarcity. If I don't do this right now, we've got reciprocity because it's, yay, I got a tax refund. Thank you. I want to lock in right away um, and get started. And again, these are these are fish that I'm showing you. These are real fish that are coming from, from fishing sites. And then um, this last one here is really pushing on the the, the scarcity, that time-based, and time-based and authority are two things that show up again and again and again in FISH. And payment are a really big one. You know, I need you to do this right away. It's a vendor. I was involved in a response activity um, on a, something called the Dire Wolf campaign when I was at, at IBM. And this campaign, the attackers were successful in getting a million to two million dollars from their, their target victims at one time. So they had done really good reconnaissance to know that they had target victims that regularly did move a million or two million dollars. That wasn't unusual for them, which is, you know, you got to find a particular target to get somebody who's using, who's, who's moving that kind of money. But then what they did was they did, they, it was about immediacy and they got actually into the middle of the, of the, uh, the, the transaction when it was being done and told people that they they needed to call up a special number and to reset their their one-time password and of course that number was not going to an actual bank it was going to the attackers but it started with saying this needs to get paid right now here's something that needs to get paid and then this other one a similar but this one is this is coming from the ceo right and and it might say you might say well you know it wouldn't ever say request from ceo it might say request to but they know this they're also looking at us on our social media, they looked at us on LinkedIn. So it's not that hard to find out who the CEO of your company is. It's not that hard to find out even sometimes who somebody's a direct report their manager is, who's their CFO. So, and obviously who's doing the financial transactions. So these requests, it says request from CEO, but it could say request from the actual name of your CEO. And then again, um, this is going to the chief financial officer, but here we've got to do this, Pretty big uh, transfer, it's gotta be done by today. 
So the scarcity, the authority again and again and again, you see this come up. So how can we turn this around at our own organizations and even with ourselves to remind ourselves that even when someone's being really friendly and asking us our dog's name, that we don't want to give our dog's name out because it's going to be part of the um, part of we're going to potentially be socially engineered that way. And it's really to, to get into that mindset, use these solutions, but use them really for good with our employees. Don't just make people sit through a video that's really super boring once a year. Um, another thing that I find is just not helpful is when you fish your employees, but then make them feel terrible about being fished or send a fish that's really indistinguishable from a, an actual email. I mean, I've seen some fish where I'm like, how on earth do you think that your employee ever would have been able to determine that this was this was a phishing email? And they're like, I don't know, I wanted it to be so good that they would get fooled. Well, you don't want to fool your employees. You want to help them understand and be red flagged so that they're your first responders. So how do we model the right behavior? Um, we can use consistency by asking people about that lapel pin. Say, everybody, say to everybody if you have a meeting and say, hey, um, do you commit to these principles? Do you commit to being on the front lines of defense for our country? For And I do mean country because cybersecurity is impacting the, the whole country. And in fact, after the ransomware attack that was related to um, uh, the Hafnium attack the, on the MS Exchange servers, the DOJ actually authorized the FBI to go into companies' servers if they hadn't patched them and do the patching for them. And it's because that attack was deemed so important to national security. So it's okay. You're not really blowing things out of proportion if you say, do you, do you commit to the security of our, our country and security of our company? And just by them saying, I do, and maybe giving them a, a little a challenge coin or a lapel pin or a sticker, that starts to build that consistency. So the next time an email comes in that looks a little bit hinky, they're gonna be a lot more likely to think, hey, I'm part of the solution and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna just fall for this. Um, also, uh, give them something back. So that goes back to like that challenge coin, or if they do make that commitment, give them that lapel pin, because that gives that builds that reciprocity. And Importantly, make sure that senior management is involved because that's where you get the authority. If senior management's like, yeah, you know, I'm too good for, I'm too good for security training, or this isn't, I would never click on it. That doesn't send the right message to the rest of the employees. So you want to make sure that they understand everybody's in it together and everybody takes it seriously, and that the authority figures know how important it is and have have um, have underscored that. Um, now, some other things you can do is you can create this really customer facing mindset. Um, so really look at, you know, you want to have that, I mean, I'm sorry, the customer facing behavior with that internal consulting mindset. So you want to look out for, you know, how people are, are interacting with these systems, but also inside for you that as you're, you're, you're doing consulting for them. So you're really engaging them in part of the solution and you're keeping them as part of the, the of, of, of helping. So you want them to like you as you're helping them to understand what to do. That's again, another reason why I'm really, really against these fishes that after somebody clicks that they're shamed. I've seen companies do these awful like wall of shame, wall of sheep, look who clicked, and they're embarrassing people. You don't wanna do that. You wanna do the opposite. You wanna show the people who reported a fish. You wanna celebrate the good, don't shame people. Um, and then uh, as more people start doing it, you create this really this culture of response and doing the right thing. And people kind of encourage each other to do the right thing. You build this consensus. And my best example of this was back again when I was at IBM. One of our um, employees, one of our colleagues in the, the group I worked in in IBM security, had gone on vacation. We all knew he was on vacation. And in the middle of his vacation week, we're all sitting at our desks and we got same time was the instant messaging we used. I don't think it exists anymore, but um, we all got this pop-up and it was, this, this person was inviting us to, you know, same time chat, but it was a massive group chat. There were like 150 of us on this group chat. And so pop, 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 we all go into the group chat and go into the group chat because we're like, hey, maybe there's something he needs to do. And it's not unusual, people work on vacation. And, uh, and we get into the chat and he's not there, the person who invited us. And of the those of us that were in the chat, we started to do the, the, the digital equivalent of like, you know, sort of looking around the room and typing to each other, you know, 
do you know why he invited us? Do you know what this is about? Has anybody talked to him since he went on vacation? And after about 10 minutes, we all realized for some reason he wasn't there. There was no reason for all of us to be in this chat. And we, we got, but we started to go off but a number of us were like, do you think that maybe this is a hack? Could this be, an, we were IBM security, you know, like maybe somebody's targeting us. Um, within about an hour, the help desk had to write to all of us on that call and say, it's okay, guys, please stop reporting this as a potential incident because it wasn't, it turned out that the employee had been tracked down by the lake on vacation and had by accident just fat fingered. <laughs> and started this group chat with oh, you know, a huge number of his contacts. So it was all clear, he had started it. It was an accident he had immediately just closed. If he'd stayed on the chat, we would have known, but he just went like, oops, and closed his laptop thinking maybe like it, the, the chat wouldn't have actually started. Uh, but the help desk had to tell us to, to all of us to stop reporting it because we had huge consensus and, and, and a huge response and, and it was innate in us that we saw something un unnatural that we needed to report it. So that's the kind of, it, although the help desk did have to write to all of us, that's actually the kind of, of response that you want from your employees. You want them to feel that they are part of the solution and part of, of the way to make this, this better. So some of the principles of, of security awareness training overall, uh, how, to, how to get started with it to get past just that like boring video that nobody watches anyway. Think about the people at your company. So use this, like actually do a design principle with it. And you, know, you can use personas and use cases to map them out. So uh, create those. Think about who your, who your employees are and what drives them. Because if you can connect to them as people and what drives them as people, you're much more likely to get them to respond and respond in a positive way. And then also think about um, their, you know, their behavior intention. So what, how they're going to actually react in a, in a given situation and be really empathic about this. Very often what happens in security training is that we try and force people to react the way we want them to. So we want them to not be the kind of person that says my dog's name. Right. What, what actually helps more is to train them not to ever use their dog's name as, as something that's secret. So my dogs, I write about my dogs online. My dog's names are Nick and Nora. And yes, they are named after the thin man. But if you think they're named after the infinite playlist, that works too. Um, it's generally, I, I, it seems to skew by age, which Nick and Nora uh, get connected to them, but they're Nick and Nora. And I, they're not any of my passwords, not even close to anything that's any secret code or any, you know, passphrase for me, nothing. If you, if I'm doing a knowledge-based authentication and it says, what's your dog's name? My dog's name is some weird random string of characters from my password generator that I then store because I, I know Nick and Nora is not something that I ever, ever use in a secret capacity. So I'm still gonna be human. If you ask me my dog's name, I know I'm gonna tell you, I just told everybody and I've told everybody on LinkedIn, the world knows their names. But the training can be that you have a response that's different and you take an action that's different. So just warn people not to use their, their pet's names, not to use anything that, that could be guessed or connected to them. So think about the behavior and the intention and work with, work with that with your, your teams. Um, looking also at there's this, this sort of awareness funnel, and this is some really interesting research that came out of ISACA a couple of years ago. They reimagined security awareness as the customer journey, like a sales funnel. And it, it's really kind of an interesting, different way to think about it. So they did that same way that you think about a funnel, but they start with, you know, awareness. People know there's a problem. We all know there are fishers out there. But how do you get from this awareness of phishing down to the action of the integration of the new behaviors? And it's these steps in between, which is engagement and learning. Like you're learning about how, why we click and what those attackers are doing to, to get us to click and then help them to motivate them to adapt to this new behavior. And then you get them down to the action at the integration of the new behavior. So not using their dog's name as a password, for example. And then also importantly, giving them a way to um, respond to so that they can report if they've, if they've seen something uh, that they can actually respond and let they can either call the help desk. If it's just an email, if you've got a way to report spam within your email system, most of them do now, 
turn that on for your employees so that they can say this doesn't look right. Give them a place that they can they can send that information and something they can do with this. So, you know, to create a socially and a social engineering resistant culture, really stop trying to make us not be human beings and scolding people and just lean into what our human nature is. Take advantage of, of things like shortcuts, give people the tools that they can use to be better, like being able to report if they see a fish, password, generators from password vaults or wallets so that they can store unique passwords so that they can actually become part of the solution uh, and make them really feel like part of the solution as first responders. Not that, oh, the problem perhaps exists between the carbon-based life board, you know, carbon-based life and the uh, life form and the, and the keyboard, but really that there are first responders, that, that you, everybody at your company is the first person on the front line Anybody who gets a fish, that's your first responder. So give them those tools um, and do understand uh, what some of the, the strengths and weaknesses of are your existing, um, your existing training now. And remember that um, you know, awareness training, yeah, once a year, it's, it's part of the solution, but it's, only, it's not gonna do everything. And that if it's only once a year, it's not gonna be in people's minds. You really wanna do this regularly so people get um, into that habit of being uh, aware and resistant to social engineering. So I, I thank you. I hope this was a little bit interesting to you and some of that research to see why, why we do the things that we do and how we do the things that we do and why attackers are taking advantage of that. And I hope that this has in inspired you to think about the ways that, that you and your organization can start to take advantage of the things we do, that you know, the cool things we do like reciprocity and consistency to build that into a socially engineered, uh, social engineering resistant culture. So thank you very much. I'm really grateful for your time this morning. And um, I think now we can open it up to questions. Uh, Heather, I think you yep, I got I figured it out. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Diana. That that was fabulous. I, I love to hear from uh, the, the psychology behind it and how we can easily fall into that. Um, if anyone does have any questions, please type it into the Q&A box. I prefer over the chat box. Um, this way we can monitor the questions. Um, and uh, Diana would be happy to answer any questions. While we're waiting for some questions to come in, it made me think of um, you know, uh, generations and how I, I, I don't know if I'm stereotyping or not, but I find that like my parents' generation are more easily tricked and susceptible. I just got a call from my father two weeks ago. Heather, I'm really concerned. There's a warrant out for my arrest. <laughs> like he was panicking and I'm thinking, what did you do? <laughs> you know, like, the, but I'm like, no dad, it's a scam. But he's like, no, are you sure? And it's just, it, it scares me to think about how, how so easily some people could trick someone who just never doesn't do anything wrong is worried that there's a warrant out for their arrest. That's that's it. I used, actually used to go around and talk to Better Business Bureaus when I was at Microsoft as part of our social awareness campaign because Microsoft is like the number one company for if you get and they, they target the elderly, these attackers, they'll say, hey, I'm calling from Microsoft and there's a problem with your Windows device. We want to help you. And then they help you right into your bank account and transfer money out, and it's awful. But they're they're using the authority of a of a of a well known you know trusted company. Yeah. So I see I see Megan had the question about um, password encryption, password vault wallets. Um, there's LastPass. There's one password. I personally use one from McAfee called Remember, and I like it because there's a little bear. <laughs> that, that helps you that helps you with your passwords but but all of these so um last pass a dash lane is another one that's very well known so these any of those four you really can't go wrong with um, but what they do for anybody that doesn't know or hasn't used one is that these they do two a couple of really good things one is that they will generate pseudo random passwords the reason pseudo random is there's no real randomness but um let's just say we'll say random um they, they generate um, random passwords for you that are unique and you can say, I want it to be this long. I want characters or no characters. I want uh, capitals or no capitals. So that you have one for every different place that you go. So that, that stops those credential stuffing and credential reuse kinds of attacks I was talking about. 
Um, the other thing is that they uh, that they can help you. They'll log in. So a lot of them, if you want to use them, you can use extensions in your browser so that it'll just come up and help you log in. So you don't have to keep writing your user ID and password. They'll do an autofill on the form for you. And then an, a, one of the, my favorite things about these tools, in addition to really easily generating unique passwords, is that they will also, if you put in the website that that password is associated with, they will warn you if you're trying to put it into the wrong website. They'll say this isn't the right one. So that if you won't see that, you won't see your, your, your pop-up with, I'm ready to fill this form, you won't be able to fill it in. So if it's if I if I was going to, you know, Bank of America instead of Bank of America, I wouldn't see my little bear pop up and say, I'm ready to fill this in because my bear isn't going to fill in Bank of America. It's only going to go to Bank of America. So it's another really um, good feature. And then I had talked about this other kind of off-label use that I use it for, which is I actually generate a random password for my knowledge-based authentication. Um, now, if you're obviously, if you're talking to the government and the government says that for something related to your taxes and there's a need for your mother's maiden name, yes, you know, then you, you, you have to give accurate information. But most knowledge-based authentication, if my the airlines, they want to know what my mother's maiden name is as part of that. If we need to recover your, you know, the school, the, the street you grew up on, well, I grew up on blah, 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 X, Y, Z, 258 Street, um, because that's, I, I generate a unique response, and then I store those too, um, so that if someone's trying to recover my account, it can be very, very, very difficult for them because, you know, that also gives another another like hurdle for the attacker because most of us actually, there are ways to find out the streets that we've lived on previously in our lives and our mother's maiden names. Hmm. Thank you. Barb asks, well, she says, thank you for the great information. But then she asks, do you have any recommendations or sources for awareness training and or software security training for developers? Yeah, so for security awareness training, there's a company called No Before, and they're actually quite good. It's, it's No, B, and Four, um, letter B and, and Four. Um, so they're, they're a really good training company. As far as security for software developers, I still think they're they're kind of classics in the space. But um, two, one is is Gary McGraw. He wrote um, Software Security and Building Security In, and he's really one of the the leading lights and thinkers about software security. He also founded BSIM, which is the Building Security and Maturity Model, which shows which parts of a security development program work better for stronger applications. And then Mike Howard at Microsoft wrote a book called uh, SDL which is the secure development life cycle. And a form of that is still used at, at Microsoft. So those are, those are two really good uh, books to get started with on security training for employees and then uh, for security um, application security training. Um, and then the other thing that is I would strongly recommend is Adam Shostak's book on threat modeling. It's a really easy read and threat modeling is such an important part of what we do in software security these days that um, getting that background is really, really helpful. Thank you. And Vanada wants to know what you use or what do you even suggest to save the passwords and usernames? I, I do use, um, I use Remember. I, because I, I like the bear. I mean, it's 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 McAfee. Um, you know, it was a Canadian company that, that I had had researched before and, and looked into. And um, but I, I personally use Remember. But um, LastPass, One Password, and Dashlane are all really really good options. I would recommend using though one of the wallets versus just uh, a lot of the systems now will have. Uh, you know, like plugins, like you know, Google might offer to save your passwords in Chrome, or um, your iOS device might offer to save your passwords for you. But the reason that I like using one of these third parties is, uh, again, flexibility, and also it, it doesn't tie you into one operating system or one, um, you know, just one browser. So I, I, I kind of go all over the place. I, I have a Mac, I have a, a Linux box, I have an iOS device, I have, I have Android devices. So I really like that I'm able to use this on all of those different devices, the flexibility of that. Fantastic. Um, any other questions? I think you answered them all. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Diana. This was really helpful. I really appreciate you um, taking the time to join us this morning and um, 
sharing your expertise with us. This is this is um, great for uh, use in our um, employment world as well as in our uh, individual lives. So very helpful information. I thank you so much. As I mentioned, everybody, um, my uh, colleague Katie is going to put the link in for our survey into the general chat. Um, I think she put it in already. Okay, I just see that. So please, if you wouldn't mind, just you know, um, doing that at some point. Um, we would love your feedback. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, and now I want to um, just share my screen real quick Thank to you. announce. So next month, uh, September 8th is our next breakfast. Uh, we will have uh, one of our very own, Katie Geary, who sits on the committee with us, and her colleague, Kendra Carney. Um, they're gonna be talking about financial strategies for women. So uh, please join us next month for that. Um, like I said, everybody, um, we're keeping the room open till 9.30. So if you wanna network, um, if you wanna meet up with Diana, sh um, she'll, I think she's able to stick around for a little while to answer any other questions that may arise. Um, so feel free to network. Thank you again for all the first timers who joined us. Uh, welcome back. People haven't been here in a while and um, good to see the um, regular faces here. Uh, we we hope we met our mission to, uh, to educate and aspire and be inspired. So um, have a wonderful day, everybody, and um, enjoy our, our last month of summer here before we meet again in September. Thanks again, Diana.